two, one. What is up, everybody? Monday, and we are back again with another crew cast. And I'm enjoying these. Uh, Bob, apparently, is what he's called. Is he called Bob? Did I call him Dave? I'm talking about a minion who's sat next to me, who is again today's guest. <laughs> um, a lot of you guys enjoyed last week's podcast, crew cast, and I appreciate all the love and feedback that I got for that. That was really cool. So we're back again. As I said, every Monday we'll be here, and then YouTube videos Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. This whole new setup of consistency and uploading, it's not easy, my friends. It is not easy, especially for somebody who has the timekeeping skills of that rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> yeah, I, I, every year goes past, my timekeeping does not get any better. You think as you grow up, you're supposed to get better at things, but you don't. It's just a fact of life. I think it's good, though. I think if that little kid inside me who's useless at getting out of bed and getting things, you know, written in a diary, if he ever dies, then, uh, then I die a little bit too. So as long as I'm late, I know I'm still alive inside. <laughs> That's what I tell myself. But we're back again, and I hope you all had a good week last week. Um, I apologize for one video that I put up, which was the one about the passing of Griff. Now, for those of you that follow me on Instagram, they will have seen, you guys will have seen that as it was going on at the time. And I released the video uh, a little bit, so I released the video a little bit later on because originally I was, I was videoing it because my sisters were abroad and I wanted to video his, you know, kind of final time with us so that they could have it so I could make a little thing for them. But then when I had the camera there, I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll vlog a little bit of what I can, what I feel I can, because... A lot of people have obviously got to go through these similar things. Um, and I'm always saying to you guys, you know, when you feel something, you think something, you're not the only person who's thought that. Don't ever feel stupid for sim feeling a certain way or thinking something. I guarantee you there's a boatload of other people that have thought exactly the same things. So um, I just thought maybe maybe it would be useful to have it on camera. And turned out, you know, talked it through. And um, I decided to make a video of it and put it into that last um, London kind of training vlog style thing. And a lot of you... I apologize because you, you, you messaged me saying that it brought you to tears in public <laughs> and, uh, and that is a beautiful, beautiful thing as much as it is a sad thing. But I appreciate all the love that you sent through. It was amazing. And um, some of you even said that it helped you who are going through a similar situation to maybe look at things in a different perspective. And that is cool. So that's why we do what we do on those things. But yeah, um, what else did you see last week? What's been going on? What's been going down? Um, I tell you what's not been going down is this bruise on my left shoulder. Um, if you're not watching this on the YouTube version, you listen to it. The, the bruise has now spread right the way across um, the left head of my shoulder. I now look like I've been playing a schoolyard dare of who, who can play dead arm the best. It's, if it stays much longer, I am going to have to name it. Probably Brucey. But yeah. So I started taking some Arnica to try and bring this down. But it's, it's now at that really nice kind of greeny, beigey color that almost looks like your camera's broken if you take a photo of it. But really, it's actually on me. Yeah, that is on me. I'm walking around with this hideous thing on my arm. Craziness. Anyway, anyone else ever suffered from this? Um, it's obviously where I've been massaged. So the, I've got this huge bruise on the front, which is where it originated, which is the acupuncture. But then obviously I got massaged in that area quite vigorously to try and release whatever was going on. And uh, yeah, it's a mess. But hey, um, oh, hit a new PR deadlift. That was fantastic. So 210 kilos. That's my new my new PR deadlift. Really happy with that. Uh, my back and my soul and my spine the next day wasn't. <laughs> uh, but that's cool because I haven't felt doms like that for a while. Um, and a quick one I'd go through for you guys on that is um, my whole philosophy on this, you know, attacking your weaknesses. The reason for it is if you're shit at something and you start doing it, you're going to get some of those like newbie gains again. So even though some of us have been training for years and years and years, if you start doing stuff you're not used to, you will get that newbie kind of um, rebound. We call it a rebound? I don't know. Newbie, newbie spike? Yeah, where you get all these sudden kind of, you're going to get these sudden gains and changes in the way your body looks and feels and things like that. And so that's kind of cool. So I like that. So yeah, 210, it was a grinder, um, but I got it up there and I'm really starting to enjoy the deadlifts. And I can tell you now, I used to hate deadlifting. Hated it. Hated it with a passion because I, used to, I was doing it wrong. So it used to feel awful. And I just decided, well, I, you know, I'm not designed for this because I've got, you know, the ankles and uh, wrists of a 12-year-old girl. Um, it, they're ridiculously, they're ridiculously tiny. I have a watch. This is a man's watch on now. And I have it on like hole number three of 12. 
that's how stupidly skinny my wrists are. And so I just assumed I was never built for all this powerlifting malarkey because my joints and things used to hurt after a certain amount of weeks of getting them done. But that was just because I was going too heavy too quick and obviously displacing the load where it shouldn't have been. I was shifting, not lifting. Um, so there's been a really good journey for me so far. Plus this week, I put back in my bag work for the first time in two weeks. Um, since this shoulder tweak, I had, obviously I stopped doing the bag work because that's a huge stress on the shoulder and I didn't want to... Um, risk really fucking something up because this is just a tweak it is it's awkward when you when you anything to do with shoulders if you tweak something because the shoulder joint is held by all the muscles that surround it unlike other joints where it's held by the ligaments and tendons if you do tweak one thing then the whole you know, the whole movement in that that shoulder joint is going to hurt all the time so you got to be careful you've got to be sensible um but i felt like i don't know i was just must, i must have been on a high after that deadlift and i just went back in and um I, uh, I decided to do some rounds on the bag and they were difficult, but started sensible, went in light uh, and then built up as the rounds went on with the, and with the intensity of it. Woke up the next morning and couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> First words out of my mouth that the next day were, oh my God, as I tried to lever myself out of the bed. But yeah, it's all been good. I feel great now. i um, been back in, trained and uh, today... We are doing, what we're we doing today? Today, I'm going to go in and squat. I'm going to try and video that for you guys. Tomorrow, the next video going up tomorrow, I think, I think is going to be one about, more about diet. A lot of you guys have been talking about, about diet, and that's what I'm going to concentrate today on this cast today, um, because it seems to be the same old questions all the time. And I forget, because we live in this bubble, because I work in this environment all the time, I'm surrounded by people who also work in this environment all the time, and obviously, I surround myself with like-minded people, which means they all have the same mentality towards food as me pretty much. So I forget that normal people still find it amazing that you can eat ice cream whilst dieting or that you can eat McDonald's while dieting. And it's true you can. It's called macros. And we've been trying to advocate this kind of lifestyle for a long time. Um, But as everything, there's extremes people take things to. Um, Macros is not about eating McDonald's and getting shredded. But you can if you wanted to. But no one's saying that you should. No one's saying that that's a better option. But you can, is the, the point. You don't have to be sat there eating chicken and broccoli and being miserable and making everyone around you miserable with your ass of death. <laughs> because it's that you don't need to live that life. And I think this is, this is the, whole, the whole process of all this, this new series I'm doing and these podcasts and everything is to show you guys... Oh, no. Okay, so that's, that's rule number two of the podcast is to turn your goddamn phone off. Um, <laughs> cheers, mum. Thanks for that. Anyway, what was I saying? Uh, completely lost my training thought. Oh yeah, so chicken and broccoli, lifestyle, advocating, all that kind of jazz. Yeah, so today we're going to talk a lot about, um, a little bit about the diet, a little about things like that and blow some, a couple of myths out of the water and explain just a couple of things in brief to you. But then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to film um, some full day of eating YouTube videos. Plus I want to film a macro video, which basically breaks macros down to the simplest way of describing things to you with visual aids. Because as men, we need the visual aids. I know we do. I work better with them. So what I'll be doing is showing you how foods that have the same macro value can look very different in terms of volume and choice and whatnot. Um, And so today, let's crack on. I want to talk about the whole thing of being shredded, okay? Which is everyone's kind of go-to goal isn't it it's, it's the way everyone wants to look is to even you know girls and guys girls this isn't this if you are listening to this i hope some of you girls are listening to this um this isn't alienating you it's about just being lean so we 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 do put the word shredded and you think immediately you think of a bloke who's vascular and and granite looking and shredded with veins everywhere um but no being shredded basically means having a low body fat uh, pretty much low body fat with a decent lean mass behind it so that means you know you've you've held a good amount of muscle whilst dropping fat and the thing with this is is people seem to think this is the crowning achievement of being fit and being healthy and i actually want to let you know that it is not the case okay being seriously kind of shredded like almost competition shredded is not a good thing (laughs) if you've ever been there you'll know this it's not a nice place to be. The body isn't meant to be that kind of, that that lean, that that crazy lean. Um, and that's the picture a lot of people have in their head when they, they set their target goal of losing, losing fat or getting in shape. They have these pictures in their head, which are an extreme, acute occurrence. Like people don't sit looking like that all the time and you need to need to know this. And getting into that shape is extreme no matter how you do it, whether you do, whether you do it with the daft, daft bro way of, you know, turkey and, rice cakes 
which will only work like once or twice and then you, you destroy your body. But, or, you know, if you do the crop scientifically, you know, slow diet and calculated, getting down there, it, it sucks. Like you become cranky. It changes, it changes you who you are because when you get to below a certain body fat percentage. So let me, let me get this um, out there as well. Body fat percentage is a big, big area where people misconstrue what, what someone is. I saw, I see girls putting things up going, this is me at 5% body fat. I'm going, oh, cool. So you're dead. Girls, you, <laughs> you just know what, same with guys, here's me at two, three percent body fat. I'm like, cool, you're, so you're a corpse in this photo. Is people, they overestimate their leanness all the time, okay? Being able to see abs and everything, you can see abs at like 10, 12 percent body fat. Like right now, you can see my abs when I tense them and I'm flexed. And then when I get in the gym and I'm pumped up and jacked up, you know, blood flowing, veins and everything... I'm going to look better because there's, I've, I've literally forced blood into the muscle. The muscles are swelling against the skin. They're pressing hard against the skin. Veins are up. You know, and for that 45 minutes to an hour, I'm going to look great. But that's going to change when I leave the gym and that stimulus of making the blood flow to the muscles goes away. I'm going to soften off and not look as, as hard. And you guys need to realize that people take a picture in that moment where they look great. So afterwards, that changes. They don't stay looking like that. And that's at 10 at 12%. When you look in the, when you're in the gym, you've been training and you know you're warm and everything's pumped up, it can make you look leaner than that 10 or 12%. But the fact remains, the body is still at that 10 or 12%. It's just jacked up, it's just pumped. Okay? Now, if you get to like 7, 8% body fat, which you can kind of maintain quite a lot of the year round, like between 10, 8 and 10% body fat, you can, you can maintain there. It takes a lot of maintenance of diet and control and weighing your food and being accurate and being healthy and running and cardio all year round. You can maintain it. But you get much lower than that, like kind of into that 7, even 6% body fat, which is crazy lean. That's the point where people start to see like straight glutes and stuff, okay? So you are not for your 4% body fat if you can see like your triceps and abs at the same time, <laughs> okay? Don't, it doesn't even matter what fucking body percent you are. It just matters what you can see, doesn't it? Doesn't that really, isn't that the only thing? So who really gives a shit? The only people, reason people measure body fat is because when they go into competition, it gives them like a scale to measure against. And even then, it's not accurate. Those calipers that people use, dog shit, man, really. I mean, the only benefit of having good calipers is that every time that same caliper will take a similarly accurate reading so again it's just it's just a scale you have to use that same caliper every time in at the same time of day doing the same method same spot analysis blah 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 just so you have a consistency of being able to measure yourself and it's just a little bit more accurate than a scale would be that's all so it doesn't define how great you look and plus you also have to accept there's genetic limitations again like you know we've all got that friend who is just sit he's sat on the sofa doing nothing there's veins everywhere and they're lean whoop de do for them, that's how they are. And for you, that's tough shit. That's just tough shit. That ain't you. If that ain't you, it ain't you. Don't try to be that person because you can't be. They're genetically gifted in that sense. That's how they are. So there are the odd people that will maintain really low body fat all year round because they're genetically set to their predisposition. Their predisposition is to be that way. But the average person is not. So again, it's measuring yourself against realistic goals. So if you want to look good and you want to look lean, if you can see all your abs, that's, that is your crowning achievement. Getting all your abs out, seeing, you know, be, just being better than when you started. That's fine. Okay, because here's what happens. If you want to be super lean all the time, what happens is you end up with an extreme mentality. You end up being in a never-ending diet, a never-ending deficit, a never-ending hell of worrying about what you're eating. And this isn't good because it begins to create a negative relationship with you and your food. It, and it does, no matter whether you think you've got control it or not, it does. It creates a negative relationship with your food and even your social life, where you eat, who you socialize with, where you think you can go, when you think you can go there, birthdays, meals out, friends, parties, you know, all these things. You start to worry about them because you think you're going you're gonna to lose all that effort you've put in that week. Um, when in actual fact is, what's making you, what's going to make you lose that leanness and the way you look is the fact that you're stuck in a never-ending diet for a never-ending amount of time. Does that make sense? Because if you stick in a diet for too long, your body is going to compensate. You are not smarter than your body. There is no tricking your body. It's better than you at, being, at, at keeping itself regulated. It wants to stay in a homeostatic regulated level. 
So, no matter what you do, the body will compensate. So, if you stay in a diet, let's, okay, say your, your, lean, your requirements are two and a half thousand calories, okay? That will maintain your weight. So, you set yourself at 1,800 calories deficit and you start and you think, right, I'm going to stay in this and you stay in it for 10, 12 weeks. And you kind of plateau out, and so you drop that, you drop it even more. Then you do more cardio. So now you're eating less, but doing putting out even more calories. So your body's now running on less fuel, but doing more work. You're going to start putting your body to an emergency state. And what's going to happen is your body's going to start down-regulating because it's smarter than you are. It also doesn't have a conscience. Your body, we, we have these bad habits of saying, oh, you put this in and your, your body thinks, or and your body does, as if your body has a consciousness. It doesn't. It's a biological reaction, okay? That's all it is. It re- the biological reaction of your body is what's coming in versus what's going out, and then the cells, the body, everything regulates accordingly. And it's, again, I'm kind of giving it con- con- consciousness here by saying it's, but the way your body works is to keep you alive. So if you start down-regulating your food and over- expending calories because you're doing more cardio now more training because you think you've got to work harder because you've got to sacrifice jesus um <laughs> that pisses me off when i hear people say you got to sacrifice no you don't sacrifice you compromise that's that's the thing that's the difference okay um so your body will down regulate and it will start to drop its metabolic rate so it starts to drop the the rate at which your body burns and it does this to protect you, to protect your 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 organs, to protect because it thinks you're in you're in a, in a area where you cannot access food. It thinks you're starving. Okay, so what it's going to do is it, it lowers your metabolism and it'll lower it down to the level of the calories that you are taking in. So it starts to shut things down and it also will start to get rid of things that burn calories that it doesn't need, like muscle. Uh, not fat. See, when it gets into emergency state, do you know what fat is? It's a precious energy resource. So what's actually going to happen is you're going to start losing muscle and holding fat. And there's your problem. And that's why people end up skinny fat. So they never eat anything, but they're also never toned because they're skinny. They, they, they lost the muscle. They lost the muscle that they worked so hard for. And now they're actually storing fat. Plus, their metabolism is now lower than it was when they started. So then when they go back to eating regularly, because eventually they'll fall off, get sick of the of this dieting phase, and then they'll start eating again. But they don't come back out slowly. They just start eating again properly. So maybe before their calories were 2,500, but they've now lowered it to 1,500. So then they go back up to 2,500, which was their original maintenance level. But now 2,500 is not their me- metabolic rate anymore. It's 1,500. So now when they're eating back at their maintenance, they're actually eating 1,000 calories over what their metabolism's burning at. So they start to put on more weight. So you see how you're getting this never-ending negative cycle because of this extreme mentality that you started with. And that's what I'm talking about. The balance comes into play and this realism. So just make sure you understand those little factors before... You stick yourself in an endless diet just to get what? To try and look harder and leaner. You also have to understand that um, just because you get leaner doesn't mean all of a sudden your muscles are going to look fuller and you're going to be super vascular. Like if you don't have the musculature underneath already, if you haven't developed that muscle over time already, then it's not going to be there to show because all you're doing when you're lowering body fat is showing off what's underneath. But if what's underneath isn't what you thought was there already... You can't improve that by dieting harder. So that's what I'm talking about, being realistic and having balance. And this is also why you can't be in a diet all the time. If you want to grow and progress, you have to be at a level where you're giving your body enough energy to grow and progress. Make sense? I think it does. So there we go. Um, Don't get fatter by trying to get leaner, is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) I hope that made sense. Um, It's a huge subject, and it's one that I will cover, and it's one that I will go over much more in um, upcoming videos. And I will be doing full days of eating where I go through everything step by step with you guys about what I would do for myself. Um, and obviously everyone's a little bit different, but the similar rules do always apply. The same, the same kind of things do always apply because biology you know, dictates that you know, one plus one equals two. So there are general rules that you can follow, but your bodies will react differently to one another. So even your gym partner, you know, things like that. You can try things together. One 
way might work for them that doesn't work for you and vice versa. Or you might be lucky and you might both have a similar kind of structure and set up and be able to um, do these things together, which is which is, is is good. Having someone there to support you, having that, that um, support mechanism is super useful. Like Lainey's dieting at the moment, she's got, um, she's just, I think, over two weeks out now from the, let me get this right, it's the Saxon Classic, and it's the PCA Federation. Apparently very good. Apparently very fair federation, uh, well-judged and well-respected. Sold-out show. Whole, we didn't know this, so we had a lot of people wanting to go watch her. Went to get tickets. There was no tickets for a bodybuilding show. Can you believe that shit? Holy crap. I didn't think those things... You used to be able to just buy tickets on the door for that, so this has got to be a decent show if it's selling out this far ahead of time. Like This was three, four weeks ago we found this shit. Sold out. Done. One of you guys um, sent me through a ticket, kindly enough. I put it out there that I didn't even have a ticket to go and see her. <laughs> and um, one of you guys sent me sent me out a ticket. Uh, so I'll be sat next to you, sir, when we go. Um, I cannot, I'm not going to lie, I'm terrible with names. Um, I have you on here as, I know that you have like a, a, a bibliger or something it is. Let me see if I can find you quickly. Just give you a shout out because you are awesome um, for allowing me to be able to go and see Lainey because otherwise we we're going to struggle. But it's down, where is it? It's down near Birmingham somewhere. So we're traveling for it. I know that. So we're going to be down there at the same time as well. Gymshark have a new opening of their huge new headquarters, which should be pretty cool. I'll be vlogging all that. And um, it's crazy. It's kind of a Google-esque style new place. It's all interactive. It's a huge purpose-built facility. Um, it should be insane. So I will. I think we're going down there. I think that's. I think it's the weekend before. So it's around about the seventh or sixth or seventh or something like that. We go down to opening. Then the show is on the eighth of April, and then Lainey's birthday is on the tenth of April. So busy ass, busy ass few days for us there. And um, I still need to sort out Lainey's birthday present. Holy shit, men, we, <laughs> ladies, don't worry. I know it seems like it's for you. You now being a mild panic. Twenty sixth of March and birthday's tenth of April. You girls will be freaking out, but don't worry, men. We got this covered. We are the ultimate emergency shoppers. It's what we do. It's where we thrive. <laughs> so, so don't give your man a hard time. If he's uh, not got stuff sorted for you, don't worry. Don't worry. He will come through. We work best when under pressure, and uh, that means leaving it until at least three days before before you sort everything out. <laughs> um, it was Babilsby Fitness. Anyway, it's not your real name. If it is, you've been named after a hobbit, the Billsby. <laughs> but, but cheers, mate. Anyway, thank you very much. Yes, got a ticket for that. So, But I've also found out that the way the show works on the day is, um, a lot of happens is a lot of people will go watch the category of whoever's competing that they bought tickets for. Then when that category is done, they will leave. And when they leave, the seats that are now open, they reallocate on the door for people to come in. So because Lane is not on until like 5 p.m. in the evening then that means that um, actually there might be a lot more seats available on the door on the day. So that's pretty cool. So um, we'll be putting out where we are on the day, you know, what's going on and everything. So if people want to come and watch, that would be freaking cool. Um, but it should be a fun time. I haven't been to a show for a long, long time. But this year as well, I will be stepping back on stage. Yes, I want to talk about that. So I'm going to be stepping back on stage. So Back to the series that we're doing now on YouTube. There, yeah, the whole purpose of this is um, to do the strength and fitness style of things to run in a tough mudder. And I'll start an actual series. Don't worry. There's going to be an actual start point to this series. Once that I've got, I'm talking tough mudder at the moment. That's all kind of we're underway sorting out a date. Once that's sorted out, then I'll arrange um, what we can sort out that's special for you guys. who are going to come and come and join me on the day. Um, I also got a message from saying that they quite like to do something over in Canada on the same date because it's like, I want to do it for charity. So they want to kind of, it was a cool idea actually. So the guy was suggesting that he could set something up over in Canada as a challenge that other people could join in over there and it can all go on the same donation page so we can help, you know, just create more money and do a more worldwide thing. So that's something you guys would be interested in. Let me know. That'd be really sweet, I think, to um, for people who aren't in the UK who can't come and run the race literally sat next to me. Um, to set up your own challenges and things that you're going to do that people can also sponsor for you for for the same charity and same cause on the same date. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, but so once I have that date set with the exact date for the race I'll be running, um, we'll then set the series going where I'm going to take you through the training of how I get fit to do a marathon kind of race. Um, because I fucking hate running, hate it. Like never enjoyed it. I mean, there's points, I suppose, where when I was fighting and I was running, kind of a couple of miles a morning. There were points where when I started to get really fit and I could kind of 
just really trounced through the runs. They became almost a little bit kind of relaxing, I guess. But there was, I could never do it without music. If, if, my, if my music died halfway through the run or anything like that, oh my God, all I could hear was my footsteps, cars going past me. I wanted to punch every cyclist that whizzed by. Ah, oh, sucked so bad. So what I want to do is I want to try and um, show you how you can get fit for something, not necessarily having to pound the pavement for miles and miles and miles at a time. I want to try and see if we can get through it doing HIIT training style to get fit enough to do the the marathon style, which is completely doable. People have proven to do it before. So I'm going to run through a phase of doing HIIT training to get fit for a marathon. I think it'd be cool. Plus alongside, whilst I'm doing that, obviously I'll be doing the strength training. So showing you that, you know, you can still get stronger whilst training to get fitter for something that's much more kind of aerobic. Then once we've done that, I'm, I'm speaking to people now about setting up their white collar boxing match. I talked to somebody this weekend, has some interesting ideas for that, so that's cool. So we'll have this stretch of the training up until the Tough Mudder, which will be the strength and the fitness. Do the Tough Mudder challenge, then go into kind of a boxing camp alongside keeping the strength thing going. Do that for maybe six to eight weeks. Have the white collar boxing match, get that money raised in for charity. Then after that, so say that's probably going to be like, what, a 16-week stretch where we've done that? Then after that, then we'll hit a diet phase to go and do a show. And that diet phase will probably be around about 16 weeks again. And that'll be a full series dedicated to a prep series dedicated to stepping on stage. But the point will have been that my build up to stepping on that stage will have been getting stronger doing the compounds whilst getting fit for the Tough Mudder whilst also doing a boxing match. Then I'll diet down to show you that by doing all that, you can still create this physique that you can step on stage with and be competitive. It sounds cool. I really like the idea because it helps just emphasize that you don't have to be stuck in this hoodie up, ooh, I'm a bodybuilder mentality. And that's, that, was the, that was the whole whole process. I've kind of gone on a bit of a tangent there. So I have little notes here on my phone to try and keep me on track. But I do like the fact that on these, um, on these crew casts, I can kind of go a bit off, off peak. I like just chatting. I can, I, I'm, I can fill air. <laughs> with words. You're very useful in school at getting out of trouble. Man, I could I could spin some tales. Hey, maybe I'll tell you some funny stories at some point. I got so much from school. I was that I was a kid at school. I was the one that you either loved as a teacher or hated. Like I was mar, I was the Marmite kid in class. <laughs> I was I was funny, cheeky, but some of them some of them liked me, some of them disliked me. Depending on how much I like my teacher as well. The reason I did a biology degree was because my biology teachers in school were awesome. Shout out to Mr. B, Mr. Broadhurst, who taught me at Queggs in Blackburn. That guy was awesome. Plus Dr. Pearson, the guy who got me into weight training. So there you go. You're, you're more, you know, these, these people have, leave a, a lasting impression on your life. Because of those two guys, that's two things that I'm massively now involved with in life. You know, I did my degrees in biology and um, obviously the weightlifting side of it. Dr. Pearson, he was this six foot, he must have been six foot three. Um, and he looked like, the only way to describe him is, you know Johnny, how, how Johnny Bravo's character's drawn as a cartoon? He was that shape. Just this big, broad dude. And he was, because he was six foot three, obviously, then it came down to his legs and these like long, long, lean legs. So he was this cartoon looking dude, beard, and he was called Dr. Pearson. And he was a cool looking motherfucker. And he was an intelligent guy. And he, and he um, I remember he just had these giant, huge disc-like pecs. They were just ridiculous. He was like genetically gifted, just huge Arnie style chest to him. And he had that real old school classic, small waist, big broad shoulders kind of physique. And I remember he set up a gym training session for us on our sports days because some of us wanted to go into a gym. So he, he found a gym and there were about 12 of us. And for like six weeks, I think, where because we, we used to have these, um, we used to have, we'd have a dedicated day where you go and train with your teams in the school. So obviously I used to play like football, basketball. They were my main two ones at school. Rugby I didn't play until I got to uni, um, which I actually regret. I wish I played more rugby at school. Guys, if you're in England and you've got a chance to play rugby, go play fucking rugby. Once you play that sport, you will appreciate what real sport is. Argue with yourselves in the comments about that. <laughs> but I really couldn't couldn't look at football the same after I started playing rugby. Um, yeah, I can't watch football now, still to this day. I can play it. I love playing it. Can't watch it. They piss me off. They fall over too much. I mean, do these men not understand? They're, they're being televised, yeah? They must have, what, 30 cameras on them at any one time? And they pretend to be hurt if a guy's fingernail flicks their earlobe, they dive on the floor like someone's just punched them square and broke their nose. Then they roll around for 30 seconds holding the wrong body part that they're claiming's hurt before a bloke runs on to the pitch with what appears to be the world's greatest piece of healing equipment, 
that nobody else ever uses. And it's a sponge, a bucket of water, and some icy spray. It's amazing. These men who are dying on the floor within three minutes are back up and running around the pitch. <laughs> Do they not understand that there's 30 cameras on them showing them not getting hit? And for WWE wrestlers are more realistic than these guys. <laughs> so that, that's why I can't watch football. Every time one falls over, I want... that. What they should do is every time someone falls over, and obviously someone's watching it live on cameras, immediately someone should hit a buzzer that it's a fake fall, at which point a dedicated person can run on, maybe a WWE wrestler can run on and just stamp on the person on the floor. You do that a couple of times, ain't nobody falling down on the floor faking it anymore. I'm telling you now, football would get tougher again. <laughs> Put that forward to someone. Somebody in football, put that forward. I'm claiming it though. Copyright Lex. Um, we'll call it um, the truth stamp. I don't know. We'll think of a better name. I like it. It's a good idea. What the frick was I talking about prior to coming on to that? School, playing rugby. Ah, uh, God damn it. Tangents. I told you I go off on these goddamn tangents. Uh, I really, really do not know what I was talking about anymore. Yeah, so I said I was placed to play football at school and all that. Blah, blah, blah. Damn. Anyway, we'll move on. Hey, sorry if that was going on to something cool, but I've completely forgotten where I'm going because of stupid football. <laughs> what have I got here on my notes? Okay. Oh, yeah. So let's get back to... Let's get back. Let's get back. Let's get back. Oh, yeah. Dr. Pearson. That was it. Yes. So he... Um, yeah, he, he's the guy who took me training and he actually got me into the love of weight training because he took the time the effort to set this this uh, six-week tumble we had. So we had your dedicated sports teams days where you go, that was called Lamech. And that was because where we trained for the things was called Lamech. So it was basically your, your team sports day. Then you'd have another day during the week, which was technically like PE, physical education. And we did a thing called tumble. So for six weeks or so, you would get to, you would do something different. So it tumble, so one, you know, you'd be doing PE, it'd be basketball for X amount of weeks. And then the next time it'd be badminton and, and it'd rotate round. But there'd be other things in there like skiing, dry ski dry ski slope skiing and things like that that we could do so we decided we wanted to do the gym one and that's what got me into it and this dr pierce i remember to this day he uh, he said one of his things was bearing in mind he was six foot three and a big dude already he was like the, the only reason i um i don't i don't get any bigger is because my wife won't let me <laughs> i was like dude so he literally limited himself because his wife was like you're not allowed to get any bigger that's you you're done now but yeah it's cool shout out to you dr pearson and mr broadhurst um you you guys definitely inspired me to be kind of where i'm at so uh yeah uh I'll just circling back let's circle back around to because today obviously we're right back to the ugly truth about being shredded so we, we've gone through I've talked to you about the metabolism, it coming down and everything like that and, and why you don't want to do that. And yes, so that series um, will cover, the, preps, the prep start of that series will cover much more in terms of the dieting and very specifically in terms of meals and timings and all that kind of malarkey. But in the meantime, I will also do some full days of eating and do some explanation stuff for you on YouTube. Uh, but one more thing I want to cover here before what we're on now. So we've been going, yeah, half an hour. We're cool yet for time. Um, <clears throat> one of the main goals that you should have prior to setting anything, is realistic timelines. Because a lot of people live under these fallacies of, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and I'll be in a, a completely different human in completely different shape, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's not realistic. Like, you can do these extreme, extreme cuts and diets once every so often, but you can't do them all the time, and they will not last. So if you want to make yourself a different shape or you want to reduce your body fat and you want it to be long term it has to be slow and it has to be calculated and your body has to be given time to allow to adapt to it because that's how the body works the body doesn't work rapidly or extremely and maintain it all that's going to happen if you do something extreme and quick is you're going to get a rebound there's going to be a rebound effect because anything that's rapid and quick puts your body into, into an emergency kind of state and it's going to want to get back out of that as quickly as possible. Plus, if you put it into an emergency state any any time, there's going to be repercussions because the reactions that you get from that state are obviously time limited in terms of that they are short term. All right. So the goal of when you ever want to do any kind of weight loss is not, listen to me now, especially ladies, listen, it is not to starve yourself. Eating less does not mean more progression. The goal 
is to actually feed weight loss. Now, stick with me here. The goal is to eat as much as possible while still losing weight. And what that means is you are supporting your metabolism all the way through. So you, your goal is to expend more calories than you take in. But you only want to be expending maybe 200 or 300 calories above what you're taking in. You do not need a thousand calorie deficit. Especially ladies, you some are so bad for this because you do endless amounts of cardio. Guys as well. I'm not just I'm not I'm not just um, segregating ladies here, but it's a typical thing because a lot of girls don't weight train. They just go and do cardio, and they'll do like an hour of steppers and cross trainers and all this, burning immense amounts of calories, and then they go and eat bugger all. You can't do that. You can't. It's going to have a huge negative rebound on you. So the goal is to eat as much as possible whilst losing weight. Plus. Here's what you do as well in terms of just simple things. Do not add in more cardio and drop your food. That's two avenues you're using in one go. And if you use all the tricks in your bag right out the gate, you're going to give your body nowhere left to go. So you do one of two things each week. If something, if you haven't lost weight that week, first of all, address your diet. How is your diet? Are you monitoring it? Are you weighing your food? Are you calculating your food? Are you portioning your food? In some way, are you monitoring what you eat? Because you need to be. Because you need to be consistent every day in what you eat so that you have control. And when you have control, then you can make adjustments. If you don't know what you're eating, how much you're eating, and of what, talking about proteins, carbs, and fats, then you, you're pissing into the wind because you've no idea what to change because you don't know what you're taking in. So that's your first port of call. Port of call. Your diet is everything. You can sit on your ass at home doing jack shit. And if you calculate your diet properly, you can lose fat. It's crazy, I know. But the body is a simplistic machine when you break it down. If you give it what it needs to hit a certain, to do something, it will react as long as it's, the way you do it is supportive in the fact that it, it chemically signals to the body to react in a certain way because that's what your body does. So getting back to the eating as much as you possibly can, don't starve yourself. If you're going to, if, if you haven't lost weight, you've plateaued or whatever, the best thing to do is to keep your food as high as possible for as long as possible. So that means more output. So don't drop your food if you haven't dropped weight. Increase your activity. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just a little bit. Increase activity. So you can either add in an extra cardio session or you can add in some smaller cardio sessions more frequently through the week. Again, all monitored. All needs to be structured. You need to be doing the same thing every week so that you can adjust the next week if necessary or stay the same. Then you keep doing this. You keep upping the cardio and, well, activity even. And remember, cardio doesn't mean treadmill. Cardio can mean taking the dogs for an extra walk, going for a walk yourself, um, doing some stepper at home in front of the TV, uh, putting some extra sets in into your workouts. You know, there's lots of different ways of doing cardio. Bag work, amazing. Boxing, pad work. Go and do a Thai bow class or some shit. I don't know. Anything that just gets the heart rate up for like 15, 20 minutes. So it doesn't have to be a treadmill. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be horrible. But what you do is you put the, you put the work up each week until you get to a point where you're like, I am, that's it. That's my max. That's as much time as I can spend doing this cardio and doing this work during the week because you've got life. It's at that point you then start adjusting the food. Okay? That's as, as far as I'm going to go into that now because I could talk forever on it. But I just want to get that out because I see so many people who like they'll, They'll panic after a week because their weight hasn't changed. It doesn't matter. There's no rush. Set yourself realistic timelines of somewhere between 16 and 20 weeks. Don't set yourself eight weeks. You're going to fail. I would never set myself something like eight weeks. You're going to panic. And that's what happens. Panic sets in and then people start trying extreme things to get something in the time frame. Let your body do its thing. If you want a long-term result, you've got to give the body time to work, especially if it's not used to it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have plateau points. It's going to have sticking points. And it's going to be a, bit, a little bit slow. And you're going to make mistakes as well along the way if you're new to this. You're going to make mistakes and it's fine. Making one mistake or not losing weight for a week doesn't send you backwards. Okay? It doesn't. You haven't lost everything that you've done in the weeks prior that were successful. All that's happened is you've stayed in the same place. So say you're at level zero when you started. Then you lost some weight for the first few weeks. So you were like, yes, I'm like four out of ten now. Then in the fifth week, nothing happens. You plateau. It doesn't send you back to zero. You just stay at four out of ten. And then you adjust. And so it takes you two weeks from go to going from four out of 10 to five out of 10 instead of going, instead of improving week to week. Because there will be these points at the beginning, the weight loss will be quicker and easier. 
And towards the end, it'll get tougher. Plus, weight loss isn't linear, so you need to remember that you're not going to be losing the same amount of weight, weight every week as you get deeper into the diet because your body weight's got less. And the weight that you lose each week is percentage. That's all you're bothered about. So, and obviously, as you get lighter, the weight loss, the same percentage weight loss will actually show less on the scale because you're now lighter. Does that make sense? It should do. If it doesn't, you really need to just look a bit deeper into what I'm saying here. Um, because you need, all, you need to know all these things before you start so that you're able to maintain a positive attitude throughout and, under, and understand what's going on so that you don't freak out. So, and as well, if you, if you fuck up on a day, it's fine. You just start, you just go back to normal the next day. You haven't fucked up the whole thing. And that's a big mentality boost that you can give yourself. It's real easy. Trust me when I say it. Trust in Lex. You haven't fucked up just by making one mistake. Um, I, and I don't know what else can I tell you here. Um, I've got notes here. A lot of people think that they're going to look, that they're going to look bigger and leaner by losing weight. They're going to look like, like these magazines on the front of magazines because they think, well, right now fat's covering all the muscle. And for ladies, you think, Ooh, well, I'm going to look super toned if I lose loads of weight because well, let's cover this one, ladies. Okay. Tone is muscle. So when, when you hear people say, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to build muscle. I just want to get toned. That's the same thing. Let's just get that out of there. It's the same thing. Ladies, you don't have the ability to get big. Like, I love that as well. Oh, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to get too big. Every bloke in the world at that moment in time is going, huh? Yeah, because it's that fucking easy. <laughs> We've only been doing this shit for, for 10 years trying to get big. <laughs> it doesn't happen that easily. And ladies, you don't have the hormonal support to get big. Okay, you don't have the testosterone levels to get big. So lift weights to your heart's content. All that's going to happen is, guess what? Going to get more toned. Going to get toned. Going to get that beach body. Got to lift weights to get it. Cardio ain't going to do it. Cardio, long term, if all you do is cardio, see these people running on the streets all the time, I'm telling you now, has a negative rebound effect. Like anything, if you do it to an extreme, negative rebound effect. Got to be balanced. If all you do is run, what happens is that, and this is fucking going to be a kick in the teeth to a lot of people but I found this out years ago and I was like ha new running was shit <laughs> but it's if all you do is run what happens is your body gets into the rhythm of running all the time so it becomes lazy so be it because it adapts to you doing that running all the time like I said the body will adapt to anything that you do what it will try and do is make it as efficient as possible just like when you try and lift a weight using isolation it will try and incorporate other muscles to lift that weight up. So, you know, when you see people trying to do a bicep curl and they're bending their back and everything like that, that's the body trying to be more efficient, bringing more muscle in. When you run, if all you do is run, what happens is you start running, you know, knees high and you're putting a lot of effort in and it's, it's good. But over time, what happens is your knees will get, you'll see them, you see people running like this on the street. Knees aren't being lifted up. They're kind of doing these, like they're barely lifting their feet off the floor as they're running and they're not moving that much. And what happens is the actual range of motion used in running reduces over time because the body's getting more efficient. So it does basically, basically the body's doing as little as possible to get through that run every day, especially if you're starving yourself because you've got fuck all energy to be running on. So you see these people running, looking like death, probably because they're eating nothing and then pounding the fucking streets every day. And so what happens is the, the actual range of motion in which the, the joints and limbs go through when running gets reduced over time to become more efficient. And what that actually does, it actually stunts the range of movement of the tendons and shit and ligaments and things in around the joints. And what actually happens is you end up getting this fucked up lack of range of motion around the joints. And so what happens is you actually end up burning less calories over time from the same runs, yet people's diets stay the same. So when they started running, they were burning more calories, but their food stayed at the same level. So they were then burning more calories than they were eating. But then over time, because of this restriction in range of movement and everything, and I think, I think, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think things like shortening of the tendons and stuff happens. You can get really bad problems from it. You can get like, um, I think you can get tendonitis or fucked up tendons and ligaments from it and things. It's really bad. It's really bad. But what happens is because over time they start reducing the amount of calories that they burn from each of these runs because the body's range of motion gets less and less and their food stays the same. Now they're burning less calories but taking in the same food but they're not actually burning more calories than they're taking in. So then they start to get fatter still doing that running and they've no idea why. So what actually happens is you end up with this fucked up range of movement, fucked up tendons, fucked up joints. Um, it can actually really screw 
um, hips and knees as well over time. And and now you're getting fatter too, just to top it off. And that's why there's got to be balance. That's why if, if you're doing all these runs, you've got to be stretching out. You've got to be in a gym, strengthening the muscles. You've got to make sure when you're running that you're running through a full range of motion, lifting your knees, really driving through your feet, remembering to you know keep your abs engaged whilst, whilst you're running. That's another big thing. Like you end up with these duck butt runs and arms are kind of limping around in front. So there's a whole host of things that you've got to constantly be aware of when you and uh, to, to stay on track. It ain't fucking easy. It isn't easy, but that's why you've got to be constant, constantly monitoring things. It might seem like a lot of hard work, but it's not. Really, it's just monitoring a lot of little things over a long period of time. And like I said, all those little things over a long period, that's they'll take you towards your goal. So I think we've covered enough things there for now to keep you guys going, giving you some things to think about. And... Uh, And we'll move quickly on to something someone sent me this morning, which was a quick question about, um, it was on the latest video that I just put up yesterday. So yesterday I put up that video of um, me driving through um, my deadlift PR attempt, which I actually failed on the first attempt of. And I even fucked up counting the weights I was putting on. I thought I was lifting heavier than I was. So I actually mentally out-psyched myself, psyched myself out. (laughs) When I realized, because obviously I thought I was lifting heavier than I was. So in my mind, you know, when you get under a weight, you're supposed to think, that's lightweight, lightweight. I was basically getting under a lighter weight, thinking heavyweight, heavyweight, <laughs> which was the exact opposite of anything you want to be doing. But um, yeah, it, it, it all worked out in the end. I managed to actually pull the lift. I got my 210 and that was cool. So uh, is this freaking camera focusing on the microphone instead of my head? I think it is. Oh my God. Anyway, so I apologize if this is slightly out of focus and you're watching on the YouTube relying on the autofocus. Uh, anyway, back to my point. Someone messaged me on that video saying, because I, I told you at the beginning of the pre-workout I used for deadlifting and squatting, and that's to use a pre-workout that doesn't have L-arginine in it because L-arginine creates a pump factor. And what that can do is, especially for your lower back and things like forearms as well, is it can cause those muscles to, it's what's known as pumping out. So they become overly pumped and they actually almost like, almost cramp up a little bit. So you, you hear of people talking about back pumps. Well, that's what that's what I'm talking about here. And that can be created by taking the wrong pre-workouts. So I was saying before that, before the um, any squatting or deadlifting, I avoid the arginine-based pre-workout, which the EHP is the one I use, which is called the PSI. So that's the pump and um, blood flow one, but it doesn't have stimulants in it, which is really good. But for lifting, what I want is stimulants and no pump. And there is the other version of EHP do, which is called RP Max or RPM. I call it RPM. And um, that one has no arginine in it, no arginine or creatine malate. So there's no pump in there. Not creatine malate, that's wrong. Citrulline malate. Um, and they, so there's no pump, but there is focus enhancement and stimulants in there. So you've got energy focus, and that's what you want for those big lifts. And you're going to avoid getting those lower back pumps. Same with squats, because obviously there's quite a bit of stress on the, on the lower back when you're squatting, especially if you've done deadlifts before. So someone asked me, do they think do, it, do I do they think do I think that pre workouts and things like pre workouts and fat burners have they helped me improve my physique over time, and are they essential to progressing? First things first, right? No supplement is essential. Going to get that out there right off the bat. We're gonna we're gonna finish the crew cast on this subject here. No supplement is essential. None of them. Okay. Any good supplement manufacturer will tell you that just because it's the truth. Because supplements are a food substitute. There's something created to help you hit your targets a little easier when your life gets busy. All right? So like a protein powder, you're best thinking of it as just powdered meat, powdered chicken breast. That's the best way of thinking of it. It is just protein. Now... It is a well-balanced blend of protein. So it has like essential amino acids in there and things like that. So yes, it is good in fact that it's like an enhanced chicken breast. But you could do the same. You could create the same physique over a 16-week diet period, not taking any supplements, but just making sure that you got the proteins, carbs, and fats from food sources. Thousand percent, hundred percent. But supplements can make your life easier. So say you have to get 50 grams of protein in by the end of the day and you can't be asked cooking another 150 grams of chicken breast. You just don't, you can't be bothered eating that. Plus you're feeling a bit full from all the other meals you've eaten because maybe you're lucky and you're getting to diet down on a good amount of protein and food and things like that. Or even if you're gaining 
even more so. So say you're trying to gain muscle and you're eating in a surplus and you're sick, you just have too much volume of food to get in. That's when supplements can come into play because they help you hit certain macronutrients, proteins, carbs, and fats in a smaller volume and in a liquid volume very often. So it's very easy to digest and take in and hit those extra targets. So, so that's why it's called a fucking supplement. A supplement is something that goes alongside an already structured regime. All right, it's a supplement. It's supplemented into an already well-set foundation. So, with that bearing in mind, um, do I think they have helped me? Yes, I think they've helped me in terms of me being able to be consistent with my targets. Like right now, when I get towards the end of the day, I have to. Th- I don't like eating. I don't, I'm lazy. I'm a man. Okay. At the end of the day, if there's not food ready for me to eat late at night, and I've got to hit like thirty or forty grams of protein, I cannot be asked cooking more meat or uh, being cheeky enough to ask Lane to make me some more food. So I'll go and have a shake and I'll easily hit 40 grams of protein. And then I know if I use a whey that all I'm going to get in that is protein, no, very low carbs, very low fat. But if I want to bolster that, if I've still got fats and carbs, it means I can chuck some fruit into that shake. I can chuck some nuts into it, some peanut butter, some olive oil, some maybe some coconut oil, whatever to hit the fats. I can make it healthy. I can make it a benefit. I can hit micronutrients as well as macronutrients at the same time. So they're beneficial in that way. So in that sense, yes, I would say they have helped me develop a physique. But have they done the work for me? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. They don't, they don't affect your hormones. They're not a hormone. It's not like a steroid, which parents... So if you've got parents who think protein, creatine, and all this is some kind of hormonal crazy thing if you're a young kid and you just started, get your mum and dad in now. Listen up, parents. Protein it's just powdered chicken breast. Creatine is already in the muscle. It's just a replenishing thing, just like putting sugar back into the body after you've been for a big run. There's no difference. They're completely natural and fine. You don't need to worry about them. Okay? (laughs) They're cool. Your kid is not on drugs. (laughs) Um, In terms of pre-workouts, 100% not necessary. 1000% not necessary. Are Are they useful? Yes. Do you need them? No, definitely not. They will not be the difference maker between your physique goals being hit or missed. They just won't be, okay? What what is going to be the big decider in that is your consistency in diet, your consistency in training, knowledge in training, and acceptance of your flaws and fixing them. They're your main priorities over everything. Once they're structured and they're in place and you're feeling good, then pre-workouts are a great thing for maybe a little bit of a psychological mental boost and also... You know, they do, there's no denying anything with their arginine in it or citrulline malate does create, does get you more pumped in the gym, which makes you look more jacked, which in turn can create a more positive body image for yourself while you're in the gym, which can make you train harder. So in that respect, in that respect, they can help push you further. But again, on a physiological side of things that, you know, they're negligible in terms of creating more muscle mass or anything like that. Um, so, you know, they have their place in this, if you have your mind in the right place when you're using them. They're definitely beneficial. Fat burners, no such thing. So that's a bad thing, the fact that they're called fat burners because people who don't understand, they assume that literally these things, you take them, you do nothing and they burn fat from your body. It's just not the case. Most fat burners are stimulant and appetite suppressant all in one. That's pretty much what they do. So they they quell your hunger. They stop you feeling as hungry during the day, which obviously leads to you snacking less. And then they're a stimulant. So they help fire muscle fibers a little bit. So if you take them before a workout, they're basically like a pre-workout. That's what they're mimicking. You know, they're mimicking that RPM. They're uh, giving you a boost, usually caffeine-based. Some of them have things in it like your himbean, Actually, no, I think your has been banned. So now it'd be orange peel extract. And that is that can make you like a little bit high. People who are sensitive to stimulants got to be careful with that stuff because that can kind of send you a little bit, whoop, can make you feel a little bit jittery. It's like an extreme caffeine. So be careful with things like that. But just living the knowledge, they don't burn fat directly, okay? What they do is increase your potential for work output level to be increased, which in turn would then burn more fat alongside having a well-structured, consistent diet. Without that diet, they're redundant. They're worthless. They don't won't do anything but make you feel like, I don't know, jittery or a little bit, little bit, woo, little bit, woo, for, you know, 45 minutes. Other than that, they ain't going to do shit. Okay? So, yes, they all have their place. They all have their place. 
but only once everything else is already set up, done, and dusted, which some of the things we covered today. So I thought that was pretty, I hope that was cool. A um, little bit more of an educational one, a little bit more. Some of these will be like this. Some of them um, will be a little bit more, maybe I'm just going to talk about shit that's been going down. Like today, doing some grown-up shit today, literally finishing this now and going to go and view a new house because Lainey Bobster and I are looking to um, find a new family home. So we're doing the very grown-up thing of, you know, buying, you know, going to look to buy a new house and move a little bit further down south. And we've got to start thinking about all that kind of jazz, you know, because, you know, getting to that point now where you go, you got a little bit, you're going to create a little few boom babies, maybe. Whoa, whoa. I said it, I said it, I put it out there into the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, that's where we're going to do. So I'm literally going to wrap this up. I'm going to edit this probably I'm going to take this laptop in the car with me, take it down with me and um, edit this and get it up for you guys tonight. So you, this will be up this evening. So it is Monday. You'll be listening to this on Monday. Hope you are having a good start to your week. Um, remember, it's a new week. It's not a new you. It's just a new week. You fucked up anything the other day. Had a rough weekend. Had a great weekend. If you had a great weekend, fire it through into this week. Keep that, keep that flow going. Had a bit of a shitty one? Let it go. Move on. It's a new week. It's a new day. You know, stuff will happen. Time heals all. It's all groovy. It's all good. Well, it's been going down. Anything else? Oh, winner. The winner of the um, £100 Gymshark gift card voucher. Okay? I will be announcing that today on my Instagram. So make sure you stay on there. I'll announce that on my Instagram stories. And uh, my second part of my blog, the second part of my Gymshark blog is now live. So check links in the description for that. That will be in the links in the description. And that one is all about, this is the second part of the motivational one. I'll be writing a new blog for them this week. So that will go up and I'll keep those flowing. And I think, I think, I think that is everything other than the fact that it's been sunny here in England. Yesterday it was 10 whole freaking degrees. Don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. You have to like add 30 times by three, divide by a gnome, add a giraffe. So I've no freaking, I think it was, I don't know, green giraffe heat in Fahrenheit yesterday here. Um, but it was nice. The sunshine was out. I took my granddad for a beer at the pub. That's my new Sunday thing. That is something I want to challenge you guys to. That's what we're going to finish on. We're going to finish on a challenge for the day. And that is to do something nice for another person. Every Sunday, I now take my granddad out for a beer. He went through hospital, had all the pneumonia, panic and everything. You guys were awesome. Thank you for the support during that, by the way. He's out. He's fine. He's well. He's back. And he's um, he's much happier now because we have this thing, me and him, every week. I take him out Sunday. I take him down the road in his wheelchair. It's a whole thing. Have a bit of a chat. We get, we have a, he has a half pint of bitter and we have a chat. And um, it just... Because he is in a full-time care facility now, because he has to, you know, his kind of legs went and mum couldn't physically lift him. So he's in full-time care because he has to be. So what it does is it takes him out of that environment and puts him back in a family environment. And it gives him a new perspective from just being in, you know, the, the care facility. Obviously, he's visited every day by somebody, but it's not the same as being taken out and doing something that humanizes him again and takes him back to being that independent bloke that he was. And he loves it. And he now talks about it every week. And we've been doing it for three weeks and it's great. It makes him feel good, and by proxy, it makes me feel better about myself and more positive. So that is your challenge, to do something nice for somebody else today that you've been meaning to do, but because you're either a man or you're a girl who's too busy looking after the man, <laughs> and you just haven't had the time to do it, make the time today. And uh, that is where we'll leave it. Got any questions? Let me know in the comment sections below. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you are on iTunes or SoundCloud, then hit me up on any of the social medias. Again, all links will be in the description for you. And let me know what else you want to see on these podcasts. Next week, I'm going to get Lainey on. Lainey will be talking next week about how her diet's gone, what she's found difficult, what she's changed, how she comes up with these crazy recipes. If you've not seen her carrot cake and cinnamon, cinnabun muffins, oh my God. Check out her channel, Lainey's Kitchen on YouTube. There's some awesome stuff on there for you guys who are going to the summer diets, which we'll get more into in the later weeks. So... I'm going to say bye now. I really am. I'm out of here, guys. It's been Lex. This has been the Groocast. We'll see you in the next one. And we're bringing this back. Boom, baby. We're out.